it saying anything? Like, just jammy. Let's go live in five, four, three, two, one. What's up, everybody? It's Dan from Atlas Lens Co. Hi, I'm Josh. Happy Tuesday, Telecast, and hope everybody's doing great out there. Today's topic is Dan's Mojo Dojo Coding House. Coding Casa, right? Mm-hmm. Co- coding Casa House. Uh, today we're going to talk about lens coatings, why they exist, what are they, how did they get there, what do we love, what do we hate. A uh, big shout out, Ilko Rose, for uh, noting our joke in the live stream uh, ad yesterday about the peanut butter. That was our single layer coating for that vintage Canon uh, spectra coated lens. But if you want multi coating, you got to go with peanut butter and jelly. The dual coating. What's yeah. your favorite jelly? Do you like? Are you a peanut butter and jelly guy? I am. I'm a huge peanut butter and jelly guy. Do actually. you have a favorite jelly? Uh, not in particular. I think it's more like the peanut butter. I'm more specific on. Crunchy, smooth. I like smooth. I like both, but most mostly smooth. Smooth kind of guy. Have you ever had like the dual peanut butter one where it's like combined? They have peanut butter and jelly in the jar. Uh, I don't know about that one. Yeah, I'm a little I've, sus on that. I've never had it either. It's kind of, it's yeah, it's acquired taste, you know. I like the French uh, strawberry jam. Like, uh, was it Bon Mama? <laughs> Sounds right. I don't know. Sounds good. Probably Sounds bad fancy. Pronunciation. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Go to your local Whole Foods and pick that up. I and the sugar-free uh, peanut butter is the bomb. So uh, yeah, hope everybody's doing great out there. We have a trivia question. Wanted to do a little audience interaction to start us off. So what household kitchen appliance bears the closest functional resemblance to the type of machine that puts coating on a lens? Shout out that answer in the comments section or smash the like button. Let us know what is the household kitchen appliance that bears the closest functional resemblance to the type of machine that puts coatings on a lens. Let us know and you can win an Atlas Lens Co. hat. Or a hacky sack. And also, if you haven't been to Wednesday Lens Day recently, swing by, we have a 25 millimeter lens that's filled with jelly beans. If you can guess the number of jelly beans inside that lens, you will win a prize. I don't know what the prize is right now, but a good prize. And it's, <laughs> more than the jelly beans in this jar. So check that out. Come by Wednesday, Wednesday here at Atlas HQ headquarters in Glendale, California. We'd love to see you. It's open from 10.30 to 1.30. And we're gonna have coffee from Kaleido Coffee and crepes. So come on by, get your snack on, hang out with some cool people and say what's up. Um, So anybody out there, do you have a favorite lens coating? And uh, if you have a favorite lens coating, let us know. We'll try to talk about it during the stream today. Cool. So what do you think, Josh? Like, what's your opinion on coatings in general? In general, that's a very good question. Very broad. I think it really opens up uh, a lot lot of questions in the creative aspect of, like, filmmaking. Oops, sorry. Got something in my chest. Coating. (laughs) <laughs> got the throat coat. Yep. No, I gotta grab something to drink. Um, yeah. I would give you my drink, but that might be weird. Yeah. So, no, I'm okay. Could somebody grab Josh a water? Uh, I think I'm okay. We're good. We're okay, good. okay. We're good. Um, I think it really opens up. Uncoated. The, I'm coated now. Uh, I think it really brings up just a lot of questions for, I guess, filmmakers. It kind of opens up this avenue of uh, creative decisions and being able to achieve the look that you want and. I don't know, I think that's really interesting. It's, it, a lot of people seem to ask that question, is this lens coated? What's it coated with? How does this affect the image? So, I think that's I a really great point that you bring up because a lot of us as filmmakers, we start with what we can perceive in the world, right? So like one of my biggest inspirations as a filmmaker is the world around me. I'm, I'm someone who's just like a silent observer. I take in what I see, what I feel, what I hear. I try to use all five senses to try to like build an understanding of the world around me and the people around me and what's happening. Yeah. And as filmmakers, I think we, you know, look at the tools we use, whether it's a lens like this one or a lens like this. Uh, this is a vintage Baltar lens. And then here we have 
<clears throat> a Canon breech lock lens. So two very different lenses. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a 75 millimeter focal length uh, ball tire, and this is a 55 millimeter focal length Canon uh, breech lock lens, so like pre-FD. Um, and so we look at these two lenses, right, as, yeah. as filmmakers, and you know, we observe what they look like to our eye, and we see these beautiful jewel-like colors in the glass, you know, it's like a marble, right? You become fascinated with this, like, shiny, want to touch the shiny object. Yeah. And uh, it's just beautiful to look at as a, you know, as a human being, um, just observing these things. And then you put it on the camera, and you point it at a, another person, or you point it at a shiny chrome object or something, mm -hmm. and you say, well, you know, what's happening now? What are the things I observe? Yeah. So, you know, as filmmakers, I think we tend to start with um, what we're able to, to pick up and observe hands-on and experience or eyes-on, so to speak. Um, but the purpose of a coating goes much deeper than sort of the aesthetic qualities that we can observe and pick up both with the camera and uh, with the eye when looking at them. Mm -hmm. um, so to sort of delve into that more, uh, we have to think back to the early days of lens making and lens design and understand that um, the amount of light that's transmitted through the lens is, you know, pre, pre 1930s um, was a bigger concern because film stocks were a lot slower. Mm -hmm. So you'd have like maybe like a 25 ASA film or a 50 ASA film, and 50 was like fast. If you were lucky, you'd get that fast of a film stock. So everybody was always going, how do we get more light to get through these so that we can get? more exposure without melting people with lights or you know using mirror reflectors when you're outside to like shine the sun directly in people's faces yeah. and so a key point of that is like the coatings the purpose of a lens coating the original purpose is to allow more light to be transmitted through the different surfaces of the lens from the front to the back so that it's able to effectively be a faster lens because you can have a lens with a theoretical f-stop of 1.4, yeah. which is a fast lens, that's a super speed lens pretty much. Mm -hmm. So you have an f1.4 lens design, which is the theoretical amount of light transmission from the nodal point of the lens out of the lens. But by the time the light gets through all the different surfaces, because there's, you know, maybe there's anywhere from 10 to 16 different glass surfaces, mm -hmm. and if each of those surfaces doesn't have a lens coating, light is reflected back through the lens surfaces out the front and you're losing that light. So the light transmission is much lower. And so you might have uh, a theoretical uh, aperture of f1.4, but the amount of light that gets transmitted might be as slow as an f2.5 or what we call a t2.5, a t, t value being a transmission value. Mm -hmm. So people in the 1930s uh, and even before that like in the mid 1920s had theorized that if they're able to put uh, coatings on the optics to reduce reflection more photons would actually be transmitted through each of the surfaces and uh, you know the index of refraction could be improved on, on terms of the surface wavelength so they tried something called evaporative coating to deposit thin film layers onto each of the glass surfaces as a different um, chemical or mineral substances, mm -hmm. uh, substrates. So like, you know, one of the most popular early ones was magnesium fluoride. Um, why magnesium fluoride? I don't have a good answer to that question, so I'm gonna try to keep it pretty surface level today. But that was one that they could evaporate and deposit on those glass surfaces and reduce the amount of reflection and then sort of the telltale sign of those coatings is that you'd look at the surface of the glass and if a lens surface is uncoated, um, the color of the light, if you're looking in daylight, the color of the light reflected in the surface of the glass would be whitish. So it wouldn't take on um, a bias of color mm -hmm. from whatever light spectrum you're putting into it. So. Have you spent any time with like uncoated lenses or? Um, no, I haven't really delved into that realm of just. It's kind of more uncommon these days. Like yeah. people ask about it a lot and it's something that is of interest because I think people are always looking for 
as you mentioned, creative tools to yeah. kind, of, kind of up their opportunity and options mm -hmm. for showing different aspects of life that haven't been seen through the lens before or, or just have a unique perspective in your filmmaking creativity. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we have a couple different historical perspectives we, we can look at. This is probably one of the oldest lenses that we have here today to look at. This is a Bosch and Lohm Baltar. And as I said, it's a 75 millimeter. And you could see that when you hold it looking in the daylight, it's fairly neutral, but there's like a little bit of a faint blue, yeah, faint magenta. I don't know how hard it is to see that on camera, but I'll try reflecting. Anyway, yeah. just, just to put it simply, this is a coated lens, but it's a very simple single layer coating and not all of the surfaces in the glass might be coated. So you can see some reflections that are a little more neutral. So they might have only coated like the front couple surfaces and then there's some uncoated surfaces that are inside there because it just takes time and money to coat those surfaces. Them, and they yeah. thought, hey, it's not that really necessary. If we do the first few, no one's gonna notice. Mm -hmm. um, but this is most likely coated with magnesium fluoride and it's a single layer coating, so just the peanut butter today. Or maybe it's grape jelly because it's kind of purplish. Dan, what era is that? Um, that's a good question. So Eric's asking, what era is this particular Baltar from? I'm not an expert in reading the Baltar serial numbers. You know, one of the nice things that the people at Lomo did is all of the serial numbers are encoded with a year, so you can easily tell what year mm -hmm. that lens was manufactured. Um, in a lot of the Soviet lenses, but on this Baltar, this is a JZ2110 serial number. So I'm not sure. There's probably someone out there who knows, but I would guesstimate that this is somewhere from the 40s to maybe the early 50s. Um, hard to say, not really sure to be honest, but it is coded, so I'm thinking probably late 40s or early 50s. And, um, Really a beautiful example, but you can see how faint the coatings are and that most of the surfaces inside don't seem to be coated because it, yeah. it's reflecting a white light mm -hmm. back. Um, and then as we sort of step through the collection, we can see another uh, magnesium fluoride coated lens that has a deeper magenta reflection, like a little bit of a magenta blue. Yeah, you can see that more. And I'll try to reflect that into the lens there. So this is an ingenue zoom, and this dates to around 1969, 1970. So this is a little more modern compared to the Baltar. And the coating is definitely denser, and I would guess that they've probably single coated every single surface in this lens. Wow. So it has pretty good transmission. Um, this is an F2.8, and we've T-stopped this lens, and it T-stops out at a 2.9. So. I'd say this has pretty good light transmission compared to its theoretical F number value of a 2.8. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty effective and really a nice lens to look at, very beautiful. Um, and then if we look at this early Canon breech lock lens, this has like a faint yellow gold coating. Uh, hopefully you can see that there. So this predates what Canon calls uh, spectra coating, or SC is what they use as their abbreviation, which is sort of their trademark name for a multi-coating. Mm -hmm. And a spectra coating is meant to cover a broadband portion of the spectrum, whereas this uh, nice yellow coated lens might be a narrow band portion of the spectrum by comparison, um, because you're not seeing a ton of different wavelength reflections, so it's mostly like a light gold color. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I see that. Wow, it's like amber. And this back surface, I think the back surface actually has some magnesium fluoride because it has some light blue. Mm -hmm. See? You can see the light blue and the gold in there. And then I see we have a, a comment or question coming in from the audience. Uh, what, what can we... How does the coating actually increase light transmission? How does the coating increase light transmission? Hard to explain, but I'll do my best. The best way I could describe it is that it's not reflecting all of the wavelengths back out. So you'll see a narrow band of reflection. It's kind of like 
forcing the light rays to go through the glass in a straighter angle. So it's sort of like a mesh in a way. I know this is not really doing it justice. I think we have to get like a physicist on to explain it better than I can. But it's changing the index of refraction for that specific wavelength so that it's not rejected back out of the front of the glass and it's forced to go through the glass. And so multi layers of coating will force all of the wave bands to go through the glass where you'd want it to go. And so that's why it's really important for the coating to be designed specific to the type of glass that's being used because it has to interface directly with that glass type. So whether it's a crown glass or a flint glass, mm -hmm. and then depending on the index of that glass, the Abbey number value, the coating, coating like chemical composition and mineral composition has to be spectrally targeted towards the performance of that glass type to get the most out of it. Because you can mismatch it and do special things that look aesthetically pretty but might not be technically correct. Yeah. And that sort of gets to like jump straight ahead to the next point, which is like there's coatings with the original purpose of increasing light transmission value. Yeah. And then now we're also seeing the advent of coatings for aesthetic purposes. Mm -hmm. And that's something we actually dabble with a little bit at Atlas Lens Co. Besides making technically correct coatings, some technically imperfect coatings that are perfectly imperfect in order to give you better aesthetic results, depending on what you want creatively because I've heard that uh, certain people certain people uh, with their lenses they try to take off the coating and stuff that pretty normal in, the, in our industry I'd say that that's definitely something that you can do if you love modifying things and you're willing to take risks mm -hmm. like I like to say there's if there's no risk there's no reward right so mm -hmm. I love encouraging people to experiment especially if you have something that you're not precious about like you know if you can get a Helios lens for $58 and then try polishing off the coating with like a polishing compound or something like that, do it. Because the only way you're gonna know if it's what you like is if you try it, right? So no yeah. risk, no reward. Um, and there's pros and cons to that. So like, it's great to make it your own, but you're definitely not gonna get as much light transmission and that could be a good thing. Yeah. So it really depends on what you're going for. Mm -hmm. um, but to get the coating only off the lens and not affect the surface figure of the lens in terms of how well polished it is or how the geometry of the lens is affecting the light rays. Yeah. It's, a, it's a gamble, um, but take that gamble, find out. Yeah. We had another question. Yeah. I was asking what an uncoated Orion would look like. I would say an uncoated Orion would look pretty similar to one of our Orion series silver edition lenses but it really depends on what surfaces. So this gets into another um, aspect of the purpose of the coatings. And uh, something we did with the silver edition lenses is develop a special coating that allows a significant amount of light transmission to continue, but also purposefully induces reflection in the anamorphic group to create more anamorphic flare without necessarily creating the biggest uh, wash flare that's ever existed in history. So. Uh, I can actually put one of those up. Right now, you're looking at Josh and I through a 32 millimeter Orion Classic lens, and we can flare that with, uh, I'll hit you with this tungsten. Um, if it's charged, no. Maybe we got another tungsten mag light here. Yeah, we do. Thank you so much. Yep. So we'll hit you with this uh, mag light and show you, you know, once you get into the cylinder group, you get a little bit of a streak flare. And then we can switch to a silver edition. Let me grab you a different one, actually. So we're going to put on a 32 millimeter silver edition lens and take a look at that. And while we're switching lenses, I'll keep talking about um, coatings. And did anybody have any guesses as to what household appliance functions most similar to a coating machine? Nice, anamorphic memes, thank you. You are correct, it is a microwave. So the way that the material that gets deposited onto the lens with vapor deposition um, does that is that there's a magnetron that basically vaporizes and turns a powdered material like a magnesium fluoride powder into a vapor. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and that works like a microwave oven, which is um, a magnetron that basically heats water particles up so they're vapor and heats your food from the inside out. So the magnesium fluoride becomes a vapor and that wafts up ever so gently onto the surfaces of glass that's being suspended in a umbrella looking dish with yeah. cutouts for the surface uh -huh. and that vapor just wafts on there it's like the lenses are vaping um, pretty legendary stuff kind of cool wow so yeah we got another one from uh, the crowd what's going on how difficult would it be anything is possible ask and ye shall receive may not happen today may not happen tomorrow but we will show you some atlas alchemy with some special colored coatings soon obviously um and big shout out to all this and b running our technical production today for the live stream thank you so much b you're doing great and all this and it's of course eric and miet holding it down here thank you so much <laughs> always rocking um so thank you for switching us from a standard 32 millimeter orion to a 32 millimeter silver edition and um you can see that this picks up a lot more coating flare in this in the anamorphic group, yeah. but it's not like veiling the lens. So like the kind of flare that you're getting is totally different, and the different surfaces, like the cylindrical surfaces, are primarily what's flaring here. Yeah. Um, whereas with the 32 standard edition Orion, you were getting a little bit more of a glow. Cam Mackey asks, how do you guys get the secondary flares and soap bubbles? What's up, Cam? Hope you're having a great day. And I uh, can't wait to see you again, buddy. Um, so Cam's asking, how do we get secondary flares and how do you affect soap bubbles? A lot of that has to do with the geometry of the lens elements. And so, you know, some of that can be controlled. It's like trying to ride a wild horse, right? Like these are technical machines, but there are certain aspects that you can wrangle and certain aspects you can't wrangle mm -hmm. without affecting something else in the chain that's gonna create huge problems. Um, so sometimes secondary flares can come from either the spherical group that's in the rear of the lens. It could always even come from the surface of a sensor. So your, your oh. sensor might actually be catching some of the light rays on the cover glass, reflecting that out, out into the optical system, and then picking that up again through the optical system. Mm -hmm. And so you might get um, sometimes like a light green or, or sea foam blue flare that's an, a mirror image of another flare that's in the system. And oftentimes that's coming from either the spherical group in the rear, re-imaging a secondary reflection, or uh, the cover actual glass. cover glass of the yeah. camera sensor. So there's certain things that can be done to mitigate that in terms of coatings, but sometimes it's uncontrollable without drastically affecting the rest of the system in a negative way. Mm -hmm. And so we have to try to like balance what we like to call a perfect imperfection. And if you look at some of these vintage lenses, um, these, for instance, you know, some of the surfaces internally are uncoated, but some of the surfaces externally are single coated. And so you get these like washes of neutral color, which is actually a very beautiful thing. And that kind of overpowers some of the secondaries. And so that's one of, I'd say one of the strengths of vintage lens design and something that we're continually exploring and trying to improve here. And they didn't do that to try to make the flares better. It just means that the amount of wash that's inside the lens hides some things about colored flares that if you had, you know, multi-coating. So we have a, we have an evolution of that Canon um, FL breech lock lens, right? So we have a, a spectra coated, actually this is a super spectra coated. So this is, you can see if I pan this around a little bit, you could see blue, purple, green, yellow. So you basically get the whole spectrum at different angles. And that's the chemical composition of the coatings, the multi-coating, at different angles of incidence, throwing back those different colors. So that's the index of refraction that's, that's causing that. So to, to see the different wavelengths, and they're being met with the different coatings at the right place to, to perform the best anti-reflective capability for the optical system as possible. Um, and so the evolution of this, the lens that we put peanut butter on the other day was a Canon spectra coated so that was like an original multi-coating this is the advanced canon multi-coating called super spectra coating and then this is a modern um canon multi-coating so this is a l series ef mount lens and you can see that green 
is a predominant color, but you still have like blue, purple, and magenta in there. And does anybody have a guess as to why green is one of the most common colors in the coating or most prominent, prevalent colors in modern coatings? If anybody has an answer to that, you can win a hat. And if not, I'll reveal the answer at the end of the stream. And a big shout out to Anamorphic Memes for identifying that a microwave is the closest household appliance to a lens coating machine. Um, and we have another question coming in from all this. Here's another sort of modern multi-coating I'll show while we're talking. Is Slivy possible as a future to see Atlas lens that open wires and what they do today? The question is, would it be possible to see an Atlas lens open wider than what it does today? Well, that's a great question. I mean, what do you mean by that? Because we could make a lens with a higher transmission value, like an F1.4 lens. Um, so do you want to see anamorphic super speed lenses? Is that a high priority for people out there? Or you want to see a lens that has a better T value? So like in Orion, it's a T2, but really it's like about an F1.8. So if we look at the simulation, mm -hmm. when we're designing the lens, those are actually an F value of around 1.8. But by the time the light gets transmitted through all the surfaces, it's designed to be a T2. Um, so are you looking to see super speed anamorphic lenses? Let us know in the comments what your dream anamorphic lens is. We're gonna build it. We love making lenses. Like that's really my life mission for the rest of my life is besides having fun making lenses and making cinema lenses for people like us. So um, yes, go ahead. Yes, human eyesight and digital sensors are both uh, more sensitive to green wavelengths of light. So camera systems, for the most part, for visible light are designed to mimic human vision, which is more sensitive to the green wavelength. And that's why um, the Bayer pattern has two green pixels for every red and blue pixel, because we're more sensitive. We have more green receptors in our eyes. Um, and maybe that's because we're seeking that green pasture, always on the greener pastures, right? Yeah. It's actually because the sun emits more green than any other wavelength. Really? That's also why plants are green, so they can collect the most of that wavelength. Dang. That makes so a lot of sense now. The sun. Thank you, B, sun, for yeah. bringing science even closer to us, just like the heat of the sun and its <laughs> greenness. Uh, yes, all this. Kenny is dying to ask me, do you see these anamorphics used mostly for cinema or still more often? So we designed the Orion series and the Mercury series lenses primarily for cinematography, but we have such a deep passion for image making, whether it's photography or cinematography, um, that we're excited to see more and more people do stills imaging with anamorphic lenses. Mm -hmm. Haven't seen a ton of people do it, but we actually have some projects in the works where we're going to be putting Orion series lenses on some stills cameras and making some anamorphic stills because that's actually part of my personal journey into cinematography and especially anamorphic cinematography. Um, I never had access in the very early days of my career to any kind of movie camera. And so I would just take stills with my hand-me-down uh, Minolta SLR that I got from my parents, shooting film, shooting my friends skateboarding, shooting portraits of my friends, having a lot of fun. And uh, that's been a lifelong passion and inspiration. So if you haven't had a chance to try darkroom photography, I'd highly recommend it. Um, pick up an SLR, shoot some film, even if it's just a couple rolls to see what it's like. It's a great experience and who knows how long I hope it's here past my lifetime, but you know, you never know. So, and we're so fortunate today to have like digital and film photography. It's like, you can get the best of both worlds. Yeah. We got one more from the audience. What's happening? What kind of coding or lack of produces rainbow halos or is that strictly a function of the lens design and type of glass? Rainbow halos, typically that's from a reflective surface inside the lens. So. Something to consider is that flares are sort of the opposite of the purpose of a coating. Coatings are meant to redu reduce internal reflection, mm -hmm. um, but if you have a metal ring or a surface that's a little bit shinier, oftentimes that will kick back a rainbow colored halo and the light is being um, refracted out in sort of a rainbow pattern. And so you get these kind of rainbows, so. Yeah, that's not really a coating function. It's more of a mechanical reflection inside the lens. 
can be beautiful, can be ugly, depends on your opinion or what, what you're feeling that day and what you're filming mm -hmm. or taking a picture of. Uh, yeah, one more, Aldis. Uh, you mentioned super speed anamorphics. What challenges stand in your way? Are there sacrifices you have to make to have them be that fast, distortion or otherwise? Every lens design is compromise, and so to make super speed anamorphics, uh, it's totally possible. What I find ironic is that people might ask for super speed anamorphics, but they also want them to be the literal sharpest lens ever. And so it's hard to please everybody, but you could see that we have a very intentional approach to our lens design and concepts. And so if you look at the Orion series and then you compare them to the Mercury series, mm -hmm. you can see that we've learned so much in the process of building the Orions and applied <clears throat> a kind of different approach to the Mercury lenses, which is not to say that Mercury lenses are better, but in a way they're an answer to, if you don't love Orions, chances are you're going to love Mercury. And if you love Orions, we hope you're still going to love Mercury because mm -hmm. there's certain Venn diagram overlap of anamorphic characteristics uh, that both of the lens families carry. And then there's evolutions of concept design. And so, you know, if super speed anamorphic is something that people demand, uh, it's something that we can definitely do, and it's something we're often exploring. So we're always trying to push the boundaries, push the envelope. Um, I'd say there's a few other projects that we'd like to achieve first, but one of the key questions about creating a super speed anamorphic is like, how much of the frame do you want in focus? Because let's say that we take a normal 50 millimeter master prime at T1.3, pretty normal focal length, right? Yeah. People have a hard enough time keeping someone in focus yeah. at a 1.3. So now if you imagine adding anamorphic. anamorphic into the mix where you have twice yeah. as wide of a horizontal angle of view, yeah. much less of your frame might be in focus given the nature of the size of the frame because you're gonna get twice as, mu twice as much horizontal angle of view mm -hmm compared to vertical angle of view, and you're still gonna have that thin depth of field of that 50 millimeter at a 1.3. So the question is, how much of a picture do you want in focus? That's one part of the question. Mm -hmm. And then the other question is, uh, does it need to be full frame? Because you need a bigger surface to let more light through. So, you know, case in point, we can look at this uh, 35 millimeter F2 lens and the diameter of that front element. This is an F2, it's spectra coded. This probably has a T-stop of around 2.4. And then we can look at this Canon, uh, also a Canon, 24, 1.4. And the front element, the diameter of the front element is maybe about 1.7 times larger to let in more light, right? So you have to have a bigger surface to let in more light. And then if you're trying to let in a bigger angle of view, you're gonna to have to have an even bigger surface. So if you're willing to accept a giant lens, we can definitely make a super speed anamorphic, but it's gonna be heavier and less of the frame might be in focus for any given frame. So every lens design is compromised. Compromise, yeah. I believe we will make some super speed anamorphics, but it might take some time. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna continually refine and develop and try to make something that satisfies uh, not only us, but everyone out there in the filmmaking community. And if you want to see what that means to you, come on down to Atlas Lens Co. every Wednesday for Wednesday Lens Day. Get some coffee, have some crepes if Crepe Lady is here. Yeah. And we'll jam out, we'll have a fun time. It's a community hangout. And if not, check us every Tuesday on the Tuesday telecast. Um, do you have anything you want to add, Joshua, before we, sorry I didn't give you much no, time yeah, to no. speak. I a... think you covered it all. I think you answered a lot of good questions and brought up some good concepts. Um, yeah, it's just exciting to see all these kind of lenses and the progression of like lens coding and being able to see that in the reflections. That's something really cool. And you know, I'm sorry this was such a surface discussion of it. Like, I'd love to be able to get deeper, but it might take well more than an hour. And if you haven't picked up <clears throat> Christopher Probst, ASC, and Jay Holbin's book, The Cine Lens Handbook, pick up that book. It's a wealth of information. It really is. If you're having a hard time falling asleep at night and you're not, uh, <laughs> long-term reader this will knock you out for sure because it's it's a tome um, and if it's not knocking you out from reading it'll knock you out when i whack you over the head with it <laughs> so cindy lane's handbook great resource of information wealth of knowledge and uh 
Hope to see you next Tuesday telecast or here at Atlas Lens Co. on Wednesday Lens Day. This has been Coding, uh, Coding Casa, Mojo Dojo Coding Casa with yeah. Josh and Dan. <laughs> and um, see you soon. Dan awesome. out. Take care.